So guys, welcome to my webinar and thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us. A lot of um, people streaming in on Zoom, I'm going to get a few more on Facebook. So I'm just going to ask you just to briefly introduce yourself. Um, if you've got any social media you want to talk about, that's fine. Um, but also particularly what your four-wheel drive experience is and what um, vehicles you've got experience with. And obviously we know what you drive now, that's a Y62, that's why you're here. So uh, Anthony, if I could start with you, please. Yeah, no worries. Um, I, uh, I started with a, uh, well, via a GU Patrol, uh, 2010, the three litre, um, solid axle. Um, uh, and then obviously from there, went to the Y62. Um, social media wise, obviously my, my Bound for Adventure, that's my Instagram, uh, Facebook and, uh, and YouTube channel. Okay, good, thank you. Um, Ned. Hey, um, I started wheeling in 2000, when I first put my 4.5 litre GU Patrol. Had every GU Patrol since then. Um, got into the Y62s in 2014. Um, which prompted me to start the, y the Aussie Patrol Y62 page. Yeah. Um, and it's taken off from there. I've done a lot more wheeling since I've had the Y62 um, and travelled most of the country with guys that I've met on the, on the group. So like, like anything, you buy the car and it becomes a bit of a social life for you and you just be almost becomes a lifestyle. Yeah, I think it's... And a couple of these guys will be probably can relate. It's altered my life just from the amount of people that I've met, the places, the opportunities it's opened up for me to go visit the trips that I probably would never have considered to do on my own. Mm. Giving me that opportunity, you know, crossing the Simo, the Tanami, those type of trips. So yeah, it's been wonderful. Absolutely. Okay. And George, welcome. Tell us a bit about what you were driving in your four wheel drive experience. Um, basically, I think the first four-wheel drive I had was a uh, Toyota Bandera when I, when I was 18, so 1988, a long time ago. Um, sort of got out of it in my early 20s, and then probably in my, it would have been, I think, my late, late 30s, oh. I got into a D40, then I got into another D40, then I got into a D23, and fell into the uh, Y62. Hmm. Here I am today. Oh, well, that's good stuff. All right, so we've got one question about um, a lift. I'm amazed the first question wasn't about tyres, but there you go. Uh, before we get to that, let, let, let's address a couple of the, the big questions people have got about the Y62. So um, we'll start again with you, Anthony. So how have you found the fully independent suspension compared to live axles, pros and cons? Has it stopped you going anywhere? What's the advantages, disadvantages? Yeah, for sure. Um, initially, I was obviously a little bit concerned. Um, the GU I had was live axle. Uh, it wasn't locked at all. Um, and I wasn't sure whether the independent was going to live up to it. Um, but I have found... Um, obviously it doesn't flex as much, does lift the wheel a little bit more, but the traction control system on them is really, really good. Um, it also has a rear diff lock. Um, and I've also found just the, the power to be an advantage too in the auto. You can literally walk up to things and just when you need that bit of power to step up, it'll get up where the old GU, you had to sort of kick the revs, keep it moving, bounce around a lot more. So a lot more control as well, I found. Okay, so, so it's, it's powerful, but it's also the responsiveness, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's the, it's the fact that you can just, just keep it idling along. Um, and then when you need the power, you can put it in. Um, and, and learning, I guess, which, which I'm well, pretty well learned now, but still playing around with when to use the diff lock, when to use the traction control. There seems to be times when both work better um, than the other. Um, and getting used to the traction control as well, you know, keeping your foot on a little bit, letting it spin, and then it'll, it'll, it'll grip. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, yeah. good stuff. Um, Ned, what, what, what could you add, add to that? What's your experience been? Um, it's totally changed the way you sort of 
full drive, you know, coming from the GUs with their solid axles and stuff. The last couple of GUs I've had were pretty sort of standard touring builds, standard two inch lift, you know, a size bigger in tires, nothing crazy. Um, probably settled down a little bit um, with the off-roading sort of doing the, the crazy stuff and then seemed to have picked it up after I got a Y62 again. But um, I found mod for mod, the Y62 just was just that much easier. It just did everything a lot easier. The independent suspension was pretty surprising. The, the way it handles the ruts, yes, you lift the wheels, the traction control and all that, but it just climbed the trickier hills that, you know, that I had trouble with the GUs. It just did them a lot easier. Okay. Oh, that's good. George, um, what have you got to add, add, add to that? Um, to be honest with you, I've had the vehicle for 12 months and it's the first, uh, first full size wagon that I've ever owned as far as a four wheel drive goes. So everything's pretty much either B. Um, you know, back in the day, the Bandera was a short wheel base, which many, many years ago, um, the Navaras you can't even compare. Um, what have I found? I've found a vehicle that I think is very capable, that I think is um, susceptible to modifications. Um, I think essentially most modifications, if you apply it to off-road, purely off-road now, I think anything you do to it is beneficial and gives you the edge, um, whether it be lifting the vehicle, which means you won't bottom out as much, whether it means um, putting a locker in the vehicle, you know, that then you've got a front and rear locker integrated. I think, and I, I think a lot of people may attest to it, that the vehicle itself with a factory rear locker engaged, I think maybe, maybe on the flat stuff and in a bog hole, perhaps it may help. But when you're, when you're climbing up um, steps and rocks and, you know, the looser stuff and lifting wheels, you actually don't want the rear locker in. I was going to ask about that, yeah. Yeah, you want, you want to basically, you want to, as, as David Dash says, um, basically put it in rock mode and, um, you know, and, and drive it in low four without the rear locker in. And yep. the traction control works exceptionally well. We've done a lot of comparisons over the time in several videos, and Ant's been in... in one particular one that we did as a comparison where he went up uh, rocky track in Salangi uh, with his traction control. I went up twin locked and obviously Stephen, um, Stephen Clay and Ray Hart, yeah. you know, vice versa. They were comparing uh, locked and unlocked uh, their, their two vehicles. So um, look, uh, they're, they're a monster of a vehicle. Honestly, they do. Oh, all right. So basically what I'm hearing again, um, I think you'd all agree it's more capable than the GU, right? Yes or no? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. All right. Now we're going to get into some questions then, because they're coming thick and fast. So, um, briefly then, is there a real two-inch lift solution for the current Y sixty two? Who wants to answer that? Yep. All right. Go, George. I'll have it. Is there a solution? Yeah. Um, so, with the current model, we've got the HMBC, um, the hydraulic uh, motion body control system that comes out of Nissan's factory fitted cannot be altered. Um, the only option you have in relation to that system to wanting to, to use a, a particular aftermarket shock, right? You have to delete the system. That failing, there's a uh, two inch system or two inch lift that's available via on track mm -hmm. um, that couples with a GVM if required. Um, shocks cannot be changed out, pure and simple. Yeah. Um, it's part of it's part of the factory system. Okay, so so just briefly, what what lift do you run? What tyres and lift do you run, George? Um, essentially, I'm running 35s on a two inch lift. Okay, and what about you, Anthony? Yeah, I'm running the same 35s. And then? I run two sets of wheels. Uh, my dailies are a bit smaller than a 35. I've got the two inch lift. Yeah. Um, and then I've got a set of muddies um, on 17 inch steelies that I go when I'm off-roading that 35s. Okay, so, so basically you're getting everywhere on 35s and a two inch lift, so that's good. And um, you must have amazing ground clearance because standard it's 283 mil, so once you put a lift in there and 35s, you must be up around 300 mil clearance, which is, which is insane. Yeah. yeah, it's important though, 
the, the one downfall when you're off roading is a wheelbase is so long. Yeah. Um, so your ramp over, your approach exit angles are really compromised in the Y sixty two. So things like rear bars, full bars to fix your approach and exit angles, the lift, the tires help you with your ramp overs. Um, so yeah, it's kind of kind of good. Uh, well, what, what, is, good. Uh, what is the wheelbase on it? I couldn't even tell you how. <laughs> Okay, all right, cool. We'll, 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 we'll get back to that. So next question from Stephen Bloomer. How much fuel do you carry and use for a Simpson Crossing? Now, we were actually just discussing that before this started. So um, um, who wants to answer that one? Well, Venture, I think he's done a, he's done a crossing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I did it back in 2016. Um, I've got a photo here, actually, that I... Okay. Well, while you're looking up, up that, um, did you... Act it's 140 litres standard fuel, isn't it? That's correct. And that's exactly what I used um, on the crossing in 2016. So I wasn't running 35s at that stage. They were still the stock 33-inch tyres. Yep. My car was pretty much 3.5 tonne, um, fully loaded. Obviously, not much aerodynamics there. You're driving a brick, um, especially with everything on the top. Um, and I used literally 140 litres bang on the, on the nose. Okay. From Birdsville to Mount Dead. Okay, so he didn't actually need to refill, but I can see that he took a couple of jerrys. All right, so yeah, um, that's great. So that proves that you actually, if you can go across the Simpson in just one tank of fuel, then, then range is, is not, too, not too bad. And, and um, All right, so that's answered that one. Now, let's talk towing. Any of you guys tow? I tow a boat, uh, 23 foot. Um, fiberglass boat she weighs about three ton okay um, and, and talk to us about towing i've heard a lot of good things about uh, power and the control and the handling um from towing and obviously it's a heavy vehicle which helps as well yeah the stability is amazing um i've still got light springs in the rear of my y62 i haven't gone for any heavy duties uh, i've tried to maintain as soft and comfortable a ride i ride as the stock car comes with um and the balance of the boat obviously helps that. Um, but she stays stable on the road. Um, I've got a fair bit of hills to, to climb um, to get to the beach. It's about 45 minute drive from, from Rockhampton to Rosalind Bay. And like, sitting on the speed limit is just not a drama. Okay. Yeah. That, um, okay. That's fantastic to hear. Now, next question is, can you equip it for touring and keep it under GVM or do you need a GVM upgrade? Good question. Depends who you ask. Yeah, depends how much you put on it as well. I guess yeah. for touring, um, if you're looking at long range tanks and rear bars, that sort of setup, with, along with your, your roof rack, your front bar, your winch, you know, all that sort of stuff, um, I think GVM you're going to be pushing over. Um, even 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 if you set them up, and I've tried to set mine up as light as I can, as far as um, bar, um, winch. Um, I I run I don't run a steel rear bar or a long range tank. Um, I do tow with it as well, um, so I've tried to keep weight down so that when I'm towing, I've allowed for that as well. Um, I'd be under GVM, uh, but. You know, pretty close, I reckon, especially with, with, with any four wheel drive. Once you load them up for a big trip, I think, you know, four people, yeah. gear, fuel, water. Yeah, you, you've been pushing it. Okay. Um, George, Ned, do you want to add anything to that GVM comment? Go on, George. Yep. George is ways. He's probably the heaviest car I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's talk about fuel consumption and the other side of it. So that's the, that's the other question people um, want to know about patrols. It's how much fuel does it actually use. You obviously got a uh, five litre V8 there, petrol, a vehicle that weighs 2.6, 2.7 tonnes um, off the showroom floor. Give us an idea about fuel consumption. Let's talk about around town suburb stuff. Um, and then um, also freeway cruising. So um, Anthony, I'll start with you again. Yeah, um, obviously it depends on what you have kitted out. Um, 
standard, you're obviously going to get a better economy with any four wheel drive. As soon as you put a lift on it, 35s or bigger tyres. Um, I run all terrains, you know, mud tyres, you know, anything like that's going to add to your economy. Yep. Yep. Um, I, around town, would be about 20, maybe a little bit over. Um, towing long trips, uh, did Morton Island last year, towing the camper, the swags on the roof, four people, I don't know, 300 litres of water, fuel, everything in it. Uh, and we averaged 18 getting up and back. Um, obviously on the island driving around, it, it chewed through a lot more juice. Um, I think, well, yeah. I can't remember what we got on the oh, sand. No, that gives yeah, you sand and low range is more, but that gives you an idea, yeah. Yeah, that gives you an idea, yeah. So, but basically, if you can get across the Simpson and one tank, you're not going to be overly worried about a weekend into high country or anything else uh, like that. So, yeah, a fair bit of range there. All right, um, uh, Ned and George, anything to add on the question of fuel consumption? Well, I'm... Um... I'm currently running, so I'm, I'm, my, my weight at the moment is just under four ton. So I'm fairly heavy. Um, I found that my average on the highway, ever since I did, I did a Unichip X, mm -hmm. um, and it's actually come down a couple of days. I'm probably sitting on average, maybe around 15, 16 on the highway. Um, around town, probably averaging, I don't know, 18 to, to 22. Um, and if you drive it like you stole it from someone that stole it, you probably sit around 32 or 33 when I first got the chip put in for about a week. Oh. All right, fair enough. Any 32, 33, okay. Did, did you do nothing else but just stop and start? <laughs> <laughs> That's how you drive. It. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Ned, anything to add on fuel economy? Look, I've, I've got a bit of a lead foot too. Um, I can't get great figures that, that a lot of other people I've seen get. Um, my first Series 1 was a bit heavier. Um, overall, for the four and a half years that I had it, uh, 115,000 kilometres, my high, overall average was 16.6. Okay. That's not too bad. Yeah. Um, yeah, the new one's obviously different, it's a lot lighter. Um, you know, I drove from here to Melbourne to get all my mods and I averaged 12 and 115 kilometres an hour from, from here down there. Okay. So, yeah. All right, cool. So the next question then, um, does the Series 5, so just to be, um, the Y62 may kind of look the same, but we're now up to actually the Series 5 because there's been small changes um, all the way through. Um, I remember when I tested one back in the day, it actually had the gear shift lever um, effectively not set for right-hand drive. I think they've since, since rectified that. So with the latest Series 5 then, um, the question is, are there more issues with front axle weights when adding a bar and winch? I believe the weight's exactly the same through the, through the whole series. I know that the brake calipers have actually changed in the new Series 5, so some of the wheels that fit on the Series 1s to 4s don't fit the Series 5. Yeah. Um, but as far as overall weight, Obviously, you want to keep it down um, front. Like independent suspension's more susceptible to, yeah. to that front end weight. Um, but there's no dramas. I've got friends that have got the TJM bars. Um, and then, obviously, you go for the lighter aluminium bars with the winches to keep that front end under the, the Nissan's manufactured. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Now, next question from Sean Hindmarsh. Can you live with it day to day without modifying? Well, I guess that's a bit of an open-ended question as to what what you what you need um, for like um, yeah. What, what do you want to do with the car? But anybody want to respond to that? Can you live with it day to day without modifying it? Well, I don't think I don't think you need to do anything, dude. If you're going to just drive it, you know, drive it up and around the streets and you know on a dirt road. It all, it all depends what you want the vehicle for and what you want to set it up for, ultimately. Hmm. I've got a... Yeah, look, th these are really capable straight off the showroom floor. I did the Cape trip in 2017 with um, some friends that I met on the page. Um, her Y62 stock lift, um, she only just recently put on a bull bar because she hit a roux on one of the other trips. 
Um, but aside from that, it's stock. Um, did old Teletrack everywhere I went, she followed. Mm. Angles, you sort of have to pick your track a little bit better. Um, and, you know, and that's just sort of the more standard touring. I, I don't see a need for it. If you, a lot of us do sort of go out looking for tracks. So that's where the modifications come in and, and yeah. you can't sort of, you, you have to have it. Um, but for the general everyday person that just wants to go to the beach or drive it around town, work car, you don't need to mod it. Yeah. Okay. That, that, that's um, good to know. All right. Now, question about D size. A lot of people have been concerned about D size of the vehicle, particularly the, the, the width. Um, it's actually shorter than, than the average ute, particularly with a canopy on the back. How have you guys found the manoeuvrability and width of the car um, on, on tighter tracks? Um, let, let's go the opposite order. So, Ned, let's start with you. Um, it's definitely a big girl in the tracks. Um, I needed a full respray after I did uh, Cape Bedford. The tracks were overgrown. Um, once you started in there, there was no turning around. We scratched both cars completely. Um, having said that, with a GU or something a bit smaller or a U, um, it probably would have got there without as severe as scratches because yeah. um, obviously we're pushing and branches and breaking breaking branches. Just manoeuvring it through the tight tracks, you you got to be a lot more careful. She's a lot wider. Even though it doesn't sound like much on paper, the reality is is different. Okay. Um, Anthony, what's your experience been with the extra width of the car? Um, as Ned said, yeah, it is definitely, it is wider. Um, and it, it does feel really big. When you first climb into it, you get into it, it is it just feels big as well. Um, so it takes a little bit, or it took me a little bit just to get, I guess, a feel for the car, where it's at, where the width was. Um, as far as tracks and manoeuvrability, there's been, you know, a few trips that I've been on, um, one, you know, with a tree down and a narrow sort of uh, gap you've got to get through. Um, and the Y62s were literally almost scraping, uh, 200 series Land Cruiser, I don't know, you know, it was it's noticeably a little bit narrower. They got through okay. And then there was a, a Navarro with which literally just drove through. So yeah. from that, that point of view, it is wide, but... I, yeah, you just keep the line a little bit more. You get someone to spot you, and you you get through okay. It's not a big issue. Okay. All right, good. Now, um, next question: Do you find that there's now enough accessories for it? Because when the car first came out, there was there's nothing for it. But now, is it at the stage where you can get one of everything you need? Um, you know, suspension, bar, um, roof racks, cargo barrier, snorkel, all of that stuff. Any concerns there? Not anymore. Yep, everything's available. Yeah, everything you want now. Yeah. Okay. All right, good stuff. Now, a couple of questions um, now from people there. Have any of you guys sold a Y62 and what is the resale value like? I'm on my second Y62. Sold my Series 1. It was an STL. Um, I bought it back in the early days where there were no mods and no one said you, you couldn't lift them and, and all that sort of stuff. I think I paid... 65 on the road with the bull bar and lights and some accessories and stuff. I sold it for 45k um, four and a half years later. Okay, that's so, not bad. Yeah. Um, now, do you guys feel that, um, you know, when the patrol first came out, there was this absolute uproar, as you know, because not only was it um, big, um, it, it had independent suspension, which was clearly the work of Satan um, himself. And um, not only that, Satan had, had uh, joined forces with Beelzebub and put a petrol motor in it. Do you find that now that um, there's less massive surprise and people are a bit more accepting of independent and, and petrol? Or have you noticed a change over the years or not? I, I'll, from my personal experience, I've come out of out of diesels for the past probably 15 years yep. and gone into a petrol and actually my first V8 petrol, believe it or not, and probably better now than earlier because I probably wouldn't be here today. Mm -hmm. But um, honestly, the, the, the power of the petrol and the response, regardless of what you do with it, um, you know, there's it, plenty on tap. I don't see any, any, you know, anything untoward or deficient 
in respect to not having a diesel option. I think it's, it's held its own well and truly on the tracks, and I think it's proven that. Yeah. Um, independent suspension, on a, on a personal note, I've had issues, and I will be honest, that I've been out a few times and I've knocked the, um, knocked the rear toe and canvas setting yeah. quite easily. I find that if you dig your wheels into a rut and you're going up a rutted track and it may have some articulation in it, it may break off to the left or right, you essentially you get your two, two back tyres planted in the rut You've got the inertia of the vehicle wanting to go that way. You know, the, the vehicle goes that way, inertia's that way. So you can knock out the rear adjustment. Now, when they do the alignments, and very important when they do the wheel lines, they use a breaker bar to do up the, um, the camber nuts. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. What have you guys um, found? Um, have you noticed that attitudes change um, towards petrol and independent now? And have you also had problems with wheel alignments? Yeah, look, obviously at the start, the petrol was an issue. You know, I didn't even consider it, to be honest. Um, the price point for the base model STL was 90K. Um, you know, I had a 4.5, 4.8 in the GUs and they were thirsty as, so I thought, bugger this, the V8 would be astronomical. Um, so I was down the path of buying a cruiser, um, but the price drop made them just that made me look at it to be honest i jumped in it took it for a test drive and that was it i didn't care about fuel coming after that um surprisingly i've had a lot of four-wheel drives both in, in, in especially in the gears with the diesels and the petrols i kept going back to the petrols because i just had less maintenance issues less faults they were more reliable they were better to drive and um so it wasn't hard for me to pick the petrol. It was more just the, the fuel economy. Um, and, and have you had any problems with wheel alignment? Yes, yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that is, the, I guess, the weak point with the full independent, um, as George explained, um, especially if you don't get the right... If the guys doing the wheel alignment don't have the experience, they don't do it right. And I've had it that go straight out of a tyre shop go around the corner and then all of a sudden my steering wheel's, you know, crooked and it's let go. Um, the couple of shops in, in town now that, have, that I've spoken to got it all nutted out and yeah, okay. so I really don't come up with those issues too often. All right, cool. And Anthony, just quickly, have you had any problems with wheel alignment as well? Uh, no, uh, well, primarily no, I haven't. Um, uh, the front alignment, as you and I said, well, you have to get spot on. Um, there can be a little bit of scrubbing there. Um, I haven't had any trouble. I haven't had any trouble with the rear. Um, I do tend to get it aligned reasonably regularly and I try to keep rotating my tyres like you would on any, any four-wheel drive. Um, so I've, I've, been, I've been good. Okay. All right, good. So um, let's say that you've got a brand new Y62 owner coming in and um, with every four-wheel drive, there's typically one or two modifications you've got to do, which you are just kind of specific to that vehicle, either to replace a part or to, or to um, improve the capability. And it's kind of, yeah, that's what everybody does. And after that, you kind of go your own way. What, what are those modifications for the Y62? The one or two little things which everybody does and are just learned it's a good thing to do? I, I, I think exhaust, first thing. <laughs> um, look, yeah, I, d I don't know if that was quite what I, what I was meaning, yet, but yeah, okay. F followed by a supercharger and a chip, right? Yeah. No, 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 just the exhaust. Just you just really want it singing, then you move from there. Oh, right, okay, so, 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 so you get it singing, all right. Okay, N Ned, what would you say is, is the. So, 100% bash plate. The sump guard sits lower than the chassis rail, it's yeah. exposed, it's. Um, the, the, and that's something that you really don't want to be bashing on rocks or anything when you're, when you're wheeling. Okay. The stone guard that they put on as well that protects the oil filter is 1.5 mil thick. As far as I'm concerned, that's probably the critical component that needs to go onto the car first if you're going to go on any kind of track. Yeah, okay. All right, Anthony, what, what would your response be? What are the must-do mods if you're going to go touring in a, full, in a, in a patrol? Um, I get, yeah, it, it comes down, I guess, to what you're doing again. If it's straight touring, um, there's not one glaring thing or glaring fault that 
you need with them. Um, as Ned said, you know, the underbody protection with the bash plates. Um, if you're doing some harder stuff, um, probably the side steps as well. Um, because of the length of it and the ramp over, that tends to be an area, if, you, if you're doing some, you know, bit tougher sort of stuff that tarts, starts to cop a bit of a hit and panel damage is something you don't want to do. So that'd, that'd be my, my call. Okay, good stuff. Okay, now next question is, um, if um, Nissan, I mean, it, it won't happen, so, so let's just be clear about this, Nissan will never offer a diesel under Y62 because it's too old a vehicle now. And, um, you know, I think that the market, if anything, is moving away from diesel and more likely to offer a hybrid. But let's say that they magically offered a diesel engine for the Y62. How many of you guys would go for it? No? Probably not, no. Mm. I don't, not unless it had, it, it's, it, it's not going to, I don't think it'd have any more power. No. Um, no. Reliability, there's, I don't think it'd be an advantage is the engine in the patrols reliable and solid and, and fuel, diesel versus petrol, I don't know, as far as availability, water crossings, that sort of thing. Yeah, I don't think it's an issue. So no, I'd stick with petrol. Okay. All right, all good. Next question from Ian Haley. At what point is a diff drop necessary or is it not necessary at all? I've done, I've done, I've done the diff drop. Um, is it necessary? Well, you lift the vehicle. I think if you want to reduce the angle of your CVs, I think um, it's, it's not a bad idea because the, la the last thing you want to do is, I suppose, snap a CV. So if you can reduce the angle on the CV and, and return it back to, you know, a more horizontal position, then ultimately you're going to, you know, there's less chance of, I suppose, you know, snapping one. Anyone else got any comments on diff drops? George has hit the nail on the head. Okay. All right, good. Now, what have you found the most common reliability issue to be? I mean, because, you know, back in the days, 100 series always are smashing front diffs. Um, is there anything on a Y62 which is known to be a bit of a weak point? Yep. Wheel alignment in the rear. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. We covered that. Anything else? Um, no. <laughs> The front CV boots or the CV boots overall, particularly when they're lifted, yeah. can can tend to, to wear out prematurely. Um, some people have had problems with them, some haven't. Um, so that can be can be an issue, yeah. Um, and the other thing probably is um, uh, paint. Paint, um, okay. Yeah, well, that's a pretty common, green, common yeah. complaint these days for most people. Impatient, contentious issue. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Yeah, and it's not just patrol owners. A lot of people are complaining about poor quality paint these days. It's definitely a way to save costs, yeah. yeah. Um, Ned and, and uh, George, anything to add to that? The, I'll answer the other question that's come up too. My issue is the foot brake. Yeah. It, it's not difficult to, to, to get right if the dealers or the mechanic follow the actual handbook on how to, to, how to adjust it. You get the adjustment right, it's great. But I still, I love a handbrake, especially with a V8. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's the one thing I miss. Um, aside from that, look, the guys have, have um, mentioned the, the alignment. I've, six years now, I haven't had an issue with a CV touchwood. Um, yeah. Okay, how does it work as a, do any of you guys use it as a seven-seater? Yes. Yeah. How does it work as a seven-seater compared to other cars you've had? It's massive. Um, look, I wouldn't want to sit in there for a long trip myself, being six foot two. Um, but I can sit in there. My kids, uh, oldest is 11 now, youngest is seven. We've got no issues. I had four car seats at one stage, two in the third row, two in the middle row, and there's no issues. It's the biggest car I've ever been in to have that rear space for the legroom. All it is is because of the floor, your feet are higher up rather than your feet being lower um, down. But this, the gap between the second row and third row is quite good. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, either of you guys got experience with it as a seven-seater, Anthony or George? No, I, from, I, I, let, I kept the rear seats in for the first six to 12 months, but only used them a couple of times. Um, uh, this is actually the, the rear, the rear row of seats is actually a three seater across the back. Yeah. Okay. Um, which is good, but no, I ended up 
I only use them a few times, so I, I've put drawers in and set it up instead. Okay. All right. So what are the three most impressive things about the Y62 in your opinion? And we'll start um, uh, with you again, Anthony. What are, what are your top three most impressive things about it? What do you like best about it? Um, the first one, which I, I reckon most people would agree with, um, and it's sort of the thing as soon as you take one for a test drive, is, is the power. Um, for such a big car, for a four-wheel drive, they're, they're fun to drive on the road, off-road. So definitely power. Yeah. Uh, comfort as well. Um, you know, leather seats, comfortable, um, comfortable to drive, mod cons, everything there too. Um, third, I don't know. I don't know if I, I don't think I've got oh, it. There. You, there you go. Come back to that. Um, yeah. George, what, 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 are, what are your top three things that you like? And I, I've got a feeling I, I'm going to know what your top, your, your top one is. Does it yeah, begin with P? We'll go from number one, we'll go to number two. Yeah, look, definitely, definitely power. It goes without saying. Yeah. For, for a vehicle of its size and the way it can get the power down, and then that's, this will then translate to, to possibly something else, which will then be transmission. So I think the, the, the motor and transmission have made it really well. And it's a really smooth, really smooth gear change. Um, it doesn't go hunting for gears. It drives exceptionally well. So for me, you know, I'd probably say, um, you know, power, transmission, and and just I think just overall comfort. Okay. And Ned, what are your top three things? Yeah, the engine is sublime. It's just such a nice. Motor. Um, we have the same on the page. We used it since day dot pretty much. Test drive a Y sixty two and then tell us what colour you got. The drivability. <laughs> the drivability. It's a limousine on this big brick that actually has really good response. Um, it's just a pleasure to drive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's say that um, I had on here the chief designer of Nissan, and they were going to work on the next generation patrol, which is going to be an update to the Y62. What would you say to the chief designer of Nissan and he'll make your dreams um, come true? So, uh, Anthony, I'll start with you again. Uh, there's probably nothing major that I'd want. Um, um, maybe a little bit, and I don't think it matters as much. Um, uh, probably in the earlier models, styling a little bit. Um, you know, the earlier ones, um, particularly from the rear, um, weren't the prettiest. Uh, Series 5, I, I, I think personally was a lot better. Um, but it depends as well. Once you start changing bars, um, front and rear, bits and pieces on them, they're, they're probably the only elements there. So but that'd be my call, I think. Okay, so you just want it to look a bit better. Hmm. Okay, fair enough. And George, what would you say to the chief designer of Nissan if I could get them here listening to you and they'd follow your advice? I, I would purely and simply say that if I think they did this one modification based on what they've done with the Series 5 so far, if they decided to get rid of the um, grandpa plastic wood grain, <laughs> the vehicle, <laughs> um, change the centre console layout, <clears throat> make it more user friendly. I'm actually about to put in a large screen um, aftermarket unit in my vehicle um, that's going to have CarPlay in it, basically. So yeah, you know what? Give us CarPlay. Do something because you know what? You haven't done anything in ten years. Do something about it. UAE has a lot of mods. We don't get the. We don't get what UAE get. We get to look at it, but that's as far as it goes. Okay. And we've kind of been kind of stuck in the time warp at the moment. All right, and Ned, what, what would you say to the chief designer of Nissan if you could, if you could have him here? The infotainment is definitely, yeah. even back when I bought it in 2014, was lacking, um, and it's not much better today. Um, from a from a more technical point of view, I'd love the ability to actually remove traction control, not VDC because we've got the VDC button. But when you're in low range, 
and lifting wheels, especially I've noticed it in the sand where momentum still is an issue and you want to be able to continue the power. The traction control will actually still limit my power even though I'm in four low, you know, VDC off, she'll still, you know, back it off and you can lose that power sometimes. I just love to be able to have that option. Okay, no, no, that's good. Now, I've got coming up towards the end of the webinar. So if anyone on Facebook or on the Zoom chat has any questions, now is the time to ask them. Uh, so we're going to wrap up in a couple of minutes. So a question here from Steve who says he gets a core workout from sliding across the driver's seat and hanging onto the wheel. Has anyone added aftermarket seats or maybe he just needs to put some Velcro on his backside? I don't know. So what's your solution for that? Have you found it to be an issue? Um, how, how's the butt traction? Oh, look, I, th I think it's a fairly wide seat. It possibly could be a little more contoured. But look, I've got after I've got aftermarket neoprene covers, and yeah, I, I seem to grip pretty well when I need to. Yeah. Okay. Any comment from yourself, Ned or Anthony, on on the seats? I think it would totally depend. If you're off roading, then the contoured seats would help, obviously, with stability. Um, but for touring, I love it. It's an armchair. I can move my legs. I can, you know, I've got room. I don't get cramped up. So I find that I come out of the drive a lot more relaxed. Okay, great. All right, so no more questions at the moment then. Um, so closing statements, if people are considering a Y62 and over, um, I don't know, let's say U200 series or anything else, what would your um, honest advice be to them, pros and cons of the car, things to look at? So we'll go around with that and we'll, we'll start with, with you, Ned. Pros and cons. Um... I think we've highlighted pretty much all of them. Yeah. Look, I, I'm on to my second one. So, you know, you're sort of preaching to the converted. There is some things that I'd love to, to obviously to fix so we don't have those issues going forward. You know, the, the rear wheel alignment, um, you know, can be problematic, especially, you know, I had mine let go up uh, in Port well, um, Welsh Point up Northern Kimberley. And, you know, you're 40 degree days, you're laying on the ground trying to straighten it up a little bit. Um, so you'd want to get over, it fixed, yeah. Yeah, but overall... That, 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 hasn't, that hasn't stopped you going anywhere, though, has it really? Yeah. No. Okay. All right, good. Um, George, what, what advice would you give for people considering a, a new Y62, apart from putting your foot down? Well, in all honesty, I think, I think a, a person needs to look at what their requirements are going to be and what they want the vehicle for, ultimately. Now, if you ask me my personal opinion in respect to would I go with anything other than a 62, would I go with a 200? Yeah. You know what? When I bought mine, I paid, say, 64 and a half, and the equivalent would have been 94 and a half. Yeah. You know what? Do the math. And that's a VX versus a TI. Sorry, but it's a no-brainer for me. At the end of the day, it represents amazing value for money. Um, we're seeing some great resale value on them at the moment. And we don't see any major mechanical issues with them. Um, I know guys that have got cruisers that have major mechanical issues with, um, with the DPF, with injectors. Obviously, you know, let's not say the dirty word, dusting. But look, every, every vehicle has, has its good points and bad points. But in, in my absolute honesty, it represents amazing value for money. Okay, great. And Anthony, what advice do you have for um, potential new owners? Um, I'm probably a little bit on the lines of George, actually. I was thinking the same thing. Um, it depends what you're, you're after. Um, if you're after a large four-wheel drive with power, I mean, when I was looking, I wanted something that could tow better, something that could cruise with better on the highway um, and more comfort, I guess. Um, and, and it ticked all of those for me. Um, so I guess, yeah, it depends what you're looking for. Um, for me, that, that worked perfectly. Um, I looked around at a few other things. I looked at, I looked at Prado's, which power wise for towing, I didn't think it was going to come up to it. I considered a, a 200 series, um, but price wise it was just too expensive. Um, so for me, the patrol value for money, I think, um, and there's none. The independent and the, the, the petrol, 
um, which I guess a, a lot of people have as an unsurety when they're looking at them. I haven't found an issue at all. I've been really happy with it. Okay, well, great. Guys, thank you very much indeed for coming on the webinar. For those watching, this will be on my YouTube channel and I'll put links up there so you can jump to the bits which are most interesting to you. I will run more of these. So um, if you've got ideas for the next set of owners to come on, um, drop me a line on Facebook or through my website. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks everybody for watching and um, have fun with your Y62s. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Cheers. Bye.